Uh, today we'll hear Dr. John McCluskey, who will address us on issues of faith and reason. He got his BS from the Stately College of the Plains, TLU, some years back, and he did his doctoral work at Yale during the time that Giamatti, for those of you who've read that article, uh, was presiding at that institution. Uh, presently, he helps to guide the faculty in our own vocation as our associate provost, and he also teaches in our department of chemistry. But as an educated person, the kind of educated person TLU desires to create, his explorations are not locked into a single discipline, and he has practiced astronomy as a hobby for many, many years. Uh, through this disciplined work, he has found, he has discovered over 175 asteroids with the help of a robotic telescope, some of which he has named after the teachers that he enjoyed here at Texas Lutheran. Today he helps us reflect on a classic theme that TLU addresses, the relationship between faith and reason, and he does this as both a scientist and a person of faith. I invite you to lean forward in your seats and enjoy a visually pleasing and uh, profound conversation with Dr. McCluskey. Thank you, Dr. Ruggie Jones. The Bible tells us that God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Many people take this to mean that science and religion are incompatible. As you've, as you've read in your freshman experience article by Francisco Ayala, even the Catholic Church agrees that they are not. God's creation of earth and the universe is an object of faith. Science can neither prove nor disprove the existence of God. But science can show us the wonder of the universe we live in and our place in it. Most of the time, we go through our lives ignoring virtually all of God's creation, conscious only of the things that we are familiar with. Moonrise on a snowy evening. The flash and the power of a thunderstorm. The beauty of the aurora at night. And the fury of a hurricane. But it's so very easy in our busy, hectic lives to forget the grandeur of God's creation. We live on a small globe, a marble of life, with a thin skin of air that appears all too delicate when we float far above our home. And the farther we get from our home, the smaller and the less significant it appears. But if we look, and when we look, we can begin to see the majesty of the universe God created in all its glory. We can see Mercury with its daytime temperatures of 800 degrees Fahrenheit and its nights of minus 280 degrees. And the days there do not slip quickly by. Each day is two Mercury years long. We can look at our twin planet, Venus, that's forever buried under searing clouds of sulfuric acid with days so hot that they'd melt lead. We can dream about Mars with its own atmosphere, its own ice caps, and the possibility that once, and maybe even now, there's life there struggling to survive. We can see giant Jupiter, the king of the planets, with its mini solar system in attendance as it travels around our sun. 
Our Earth is little bigger than its moons, dwarfed by Jupiter's majesty. To the left is a great red spot, a centuries-old hurricane that would engulf Earth five times over. And on the right, a moon sends its shadow to the surface, touching Jupiter's ever-changing cloud tops. It's these moons that were found by Galileo, which presented one of the first scientific crises for the church. If the church is the center of the universe, as they thought it must be since God was concerned with it, why are there moons circling Jupiter? Shouldn't they circle the Earth instead? The truth that the Earth is not at the center of the universe, or even the center of our galaxy, has helped the church realize more fully that God is not only interested in the big and the powerful and the important, but also the small and the meek and the seemingly insignificant. Jupiter's moons are wondrous for other reasons, too. Jupiter's tortured moon, Io, has volcanoes of liquid sulfur. An ice-clad Europa shelters oceans beneath deep, its deep ice sheets. And we wonder, is there life there that's kept warm by Jupiter's embrace? We can also look and see the queen of our solar system, Saturn, wearing her crown of glory. And on her moon Titan, we see mountains and rivers and lakes of natural gas liquefied 300 degrees below zero. There's ice blue Uranus with its thin, delicate ring. Distant Neptune with its moon Triton. And near the edge of our solar system, there's Pluto and its moon Charon so far away that we can barely glimpse its surface with the biggest telescopes. On the scale of our galaxy, Pluto is right outside our back door. Yet even so, it would take 650 years to fly a commercial jet plane to Pluto, if somehow you could do that. Even light, which could circle the Earth seven times in one second, takes four and a half hours to reach us from Pluto. Our planet, our solar system, even our universe seems perfectly primed for life. Our sun holds us close and its gravity keeps us from straying away from its protective warmth. The sun supplies energy for life and the fierce storms which the sun sends to assault Earth get converted into the delicate aurora as, they, as the particles smash into our planet. Is this all part of God's careful design? Again, that's a question for faith, not for science. Science can say nothing about the existence of God, only explore the wonder and majesty of his works. But creation didn't start with Earth and the sun, our star. As you've read, even the Catholic Church and the popes have recognized the Big Bang and the truth of evolution for decades. Rather than belittling God, the truth about God's creation of the earth and the universe is even more fantastic and more incredible than a simple Bible story where God commanded the formation with six simple statements in six days. Our creation started in a massive cloud of dust and gas, like this one. It was so large that light took hundreds of years to cross it. And the cloud had been seeded for life by countless other stars which had lived and died prior to Earth's Earth's formation. In the same way, even now, new suns and new planets are being created in similar clouds where dark clumps of gas condense, and slowly, over millions of years, 
they grow and ignite to become stars. Hundreds of stars. Thousands of stars. Even hundreds of thousands of stars. And most of those stars have their own planets, their own worlds, circling and growing and evolving. And some may develop life that, like us, can appreciate the games that God plays with us. This is called the Heart Nebula. This is the Witch Head Nebula. She's looking to the right. This is the giant ant from outer space. And the galaxy-eating monster. Or the Horsehead Nebula. Here seen wandering through the mysterious fields of God's creation. Just as we are born, live, and die, and pass life and the material of our bodies onto future generations, so also stars live and die and eject the fruits of their labor back into the universe. And the gas and the dust that's released in the star's death seeds the universe with the elements needed for life. Every oxygen atom we breathe was created in a star and released in its death. Every nitrogen atom on our planet, every carbon atom in our bodies was made in a star and given to the universe in its death so that life could be formed. Ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, as it is in heaven, so is it on earth. And all these pictures we have just seen are an infinitesimal part of the universe. For we're part of our Milky Way galaxy, which is made up of hundreds of millions of stars, hundreds of millions of suns. And we live on an average sun, halfway to the edge of an average galaxy that looks sort of like this one. And our galaxy is not alone. Meet our big brother, the Andromeda galaxy, also made up of billions of suns. Light takes two million years to get from her to us. And this is the pinwheel galaxy, our little sister, three million light years away. And there are literally millions and millions of galaxies, each with millions and billions of stars. And each one is unique. 